Supercomputing. That's what we talk about when we're talking about BayoCAD is supercomputing. Or as we like, there are two types of supercomputing, and we kind of cover both of those, and those are HPC and HTC. That's high performance computing, meaning it's running really fast, and high throughput computing, which means we're processing a whole bunch of jobs. So what defines a supercomputer? This is where I ask questions, you answer it. So what defines a supercomputer? Is this a supercomputer that I have sitting down here? Is that a supercomputer? No, why not? What, what is a supercomputer? What does it have to be? More than a regular computer, yes. More Multiple processing units. You're, you're hitting on all the right cylinders here. Big and fast. That, that pretty well defines what a supercomputer is. Um, as a rule of thumb, we say it's about the power of 10 desktops, but that's, you know, the definition is fluid. The fastest supercomputer in the world in 1984, when I was a middle school student, has less processing power by several couple orders of magnitude than what I have in my pocket right now. So, you know, this obviously is not a supercomputer, but it would have been back in 1984. So it's a, it's a moving target as to what is what defines a supercomputer. Now. Uh, like I said, we, we generally define it as about uh, 10 times the speed of a desktop. BayoCat has somewhere just north of 150 note worker nodes, and these are high-end servers for the most part anyway. And uh, we have 13 terabytes of RAM on there, which is a lot more than you're going to find in any desktop anywhere. Um, the largest, I had to look this up today, the largest supercomputer right now is the Tianhe 2 in China. It's by their defense department. It's got 3.1 million cores and over a petabyte of RAM and runs at 33 petaflops. That's a flop is a floating point operation per second. So it would be billion, 33 billion operations a second? Or is that, no, keep on going, quadrillion, wouldn't it? It's fast. <laughs> Be a trillion. Petaflop would be a quadrillion. So a million, Yes, it, it's very fast. Ours is not that fast. But like I said, but actually, it's believe it or not, the uh, fastest supercomputer in the world, the one in China, doesn't do as much work as the biggest one in the United States, which is at Oak Ridge National Labs, because they're the one in China only works on their one particular problem they work on. And the, when it's not working on that problem, it sits there and does nothing. Whereas the one in, at Oak Ridge National Labs, they open it up to everybody. And so when they're not working on their main application, they have it's always running full out doing somebody else's jobs. And if you need more computing resources than we have here at Bayocat, there's also what we call Exceed, which is the national network of big supercomputers, maybe even the one on, you know, there's several of them around the United States. There's the one at Oak Ridge. There's one at uh, UIUC. The, it's the National Supercomputing Center up there, and uh, Stampede, which is the one at the University of Texas. These are all huge, huge, huge supercomputers. And if you need more than we can provide you, we can get you resources to get you out on those on the on the bigger ones, as well. So, types of problems are solved by supercomputer. Just just go around and tell me what kind of problems you solve on BayoCat. What what what's your area that you work on? CIS. Okay. Let's say all the search for my friend on Facebook. Oh, like data mining. Yeah. Okay. We don't do a lot of that on BayoCat itself, but we have some other resources we do that Adam's going to talk about a little later. What kind of things you do on what kind of problems you solve? Big data? Data simulations? Okay. Data mining? Agronomy. So, what kinds of problems are you doing? You're doing the computational fluid dynamics into things. You're doing the genomics into things. Both. <laughs> genomics. What calculation? DFT. Okay. Genomics. More genomics. Genomics. Quantum simulation. 
Yeah. Okay, that's quite all right. <laughs> Pardon? DFTs? Genomics? Oh, parallel calculations? Genomics? 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 More genomics, more genomics? <laughs> Are you starting to see a pattern here? <laughs> Go ahead. Pardon? Simulations? Big data? Big data simulations? Network simulations? Genomics. Okay, so you see we have a wide variety of things that we deal with here. Now, we just went last week to Oklahoma, and they have a, a bigger supercomputer than we do by about three times. They're about three times our size here. They do two applications, really. They, and they size their computers for that. They do weather, weather simulations, and they have one, what was the other thing that they talked about that they, so some, some bit of molecular dynamics. Right. And so if, if it runs those two programs happily, they're happy, they don't care. We, on the other hand, everything from statistics, which I don't know if, if you're the one doing this or, or not, but there's somebody from statistics that will typically dump in 50,000 jobs. And they'll all be really short. They won't take long at all. But we need a whole bunch, a whole bunch of parameter sweeps, that kind of thing. Then we have genomics people. And genomics people will sometimes take the biggest machine we have and they'll run it flat out for three weeks. Which, those are kind of diametrically opposed uh, targets. So we kind of, we have, that's why Bayocat is so uh, heterogeneous. We have some really big memory machines for the genomics folks. We have lots of small cores for the statistics folks and pretty much everything in between. So we, we optimize for large size, for fast speed and reliability. That's, we get quite a few people coming onto Bayocat because they've been running things on their desktops and they'll be two weeks into a three week simulation. And first of all, they're not able to use their desktop during this time, which is kind of frustrating. And second of all, two weeks in, they'll, somebody will pull the power plug or something like that and it, you know, Windows will do an update and they'll be cursing at the computer because it shouldn't be doing that, but it'll break whatever they're working on. So you know, we, we do have downtime here too, but hopefully it's a little bit more predictable uh, and, and it does stay up for, for a long period of time. It's not unusual to have at least several months of uptime on Bayocat. Do you want to go take a tour, Bayocat? I'm going to take two groups and do this. Yeah. Why is it named Bayocat? <laughs> Somebody else is on. Ah, gotcha. On the Adobe Connect, on the Zoom Zoom session. Okay, so it's it's got a little, yes. Uh, this is being recorded. We'll send out the link when we're done. Is that what you're asking? Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll send out the link when we're done of, of how to get back to and, and, and look at this again. Okay? It's, it's a group for one, so let's do like this side. Uh, take them on a tour of Bayocat. We'll talk some about some parallel programming here. No, nope, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about something. And then when you guys go over there, we'll talk to them about the same thing. How's that? One more. I guess. <laughs> Just because he's loud out there. Okay. One of the things that makes a supercomputing great is doing what we call parallelism. What does parallelism mean? How does it mean to do something in parallel? Do multiple things at the same time. Exactly. As opposed to serial, which means you do one thing and then you do another, then you do another, then you do another. Parallel, you're doing several things at the same time. That is, 
the concept of parallelism is one of the more difficult things in computer science. And the reason for that is that programming it is tough to make it, to make it all work right. I'm going to say this probably more than once, no system, not, e not ours, not anybody's, can magically make your programs run in parallel. If you have something that's, that is inherently single-threaded, which means they can only run one thing at once, and you put it on Baocat, it doesn't matter how many th resources you throw at it, it's still only gonna do one thing at a time unless it's programmed to do more than one thing at a time. So, I have some examples here. Do, 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 do. Notice I say it, I put it in bold. This is probably the biggest thing that we get because we have people that have a program that'll run single threaded, one thing at a time, and they'll say, hey, I need to use Baocat, and they'll put on Baocat, and they're saying, it's no not any faster than it is on my desktop, what's wrong with you? That's because the program wasn't written that way. Some programs are harder than others to run in parallel. Here's some example. If you have this being your data set, and you're trying to make this computation. Can that be done in parallel or does that need to be single? If you're just trying to take this part right here, multiplying all these numbers, you take have all these numbers that you got out here, and you're taking all of them and multiplying by four. Is that something you can do? If, can you take a number and multiply it by four? Can you multiply two times four? Yes or no, can you do that? Yes, can you, do, can you multiply three times four? Can you multiply four times four? Can you multiply five times four? Okay, so that's something, and, and you guys can give me the answer and I would know all that right at the end, right? I wouldn't have to, I don't have to do any coordination really to make that happen, right? So that, right, you have to, you have, to have the communication there, but the computation itself, is can be done in parallel. Now we got something a little more tricky here. We have 11 times the quantity a to the n. I think that was supposed to be a squared. I think my thing got moved up. Times e to the a n plus log a to the n plus of 17. How about that? Is that is that something you could do in parallel really easily or not? Yes, it is because there's nothing saying you only got one input. And you want one output. You could do that. It's a lot harder to problem than just multiplying by four. But there's nothing more to it than that. Now, here's, here's a trickier one, though. If we start with B0 being zero, and we have B of N equals A to the N minus B to the N minus one, so it relies on the previous value, that makes it a lot tougher now because you have to have the previous value before you can go on. Does that make sense? All right, I think we're about ready to switch here, and which is perfect, because that's how far I wanted to get through. I, let me tell one more thing. The typical usage we see, this is, a, this is true of most uh, of HPC programs. Programs will have some part uh, of it is serial, and some part of it is parallel. Uh, you genomics people, do you guys use the Perl? Uh, do you guys use Perl to, to do your... Uh, what, what do you call it, pipelining? You guys do pipe, well, not necessarily be Do you guys do pipelining? The pipelining is a serial part, and then you submit them onto Baocat to do the parallel part. Those are very well written. Those are perfect HPC kind of jobs because they know what parts are what. But what we see is we'll have somebody that asks for a lot of, in, a lot of resources, and they'll only be using a little bit of it for a long time. And they'll use a lot of it for a little bit, and then they'll use a lot, little bit for a long time, and then a lot of it for a, little, for, for a short period of time too. So they kind of go back and forth between the parallel and serial part because they're combining these kind of things that we call, we call these, there's actually a term for it, it's called embarrassingly parallel because they're really easy to do. Followed by this part, which cannot be parallel, it has to be done serially. So that's, that's the way most HPC programs work. Some of them are all parallel, some of them are, are all serial, but for the most part, that's the usage that we see. Okay, perfect time to go. Next group. <laughs>
All right, now you get to hear the spiel that I just went over with those guys. The basis of, of HPC, supercomputing, is parallelization. What does parallel mean? This is where I ask the questions, you answer me. Go ahead. A job is split, so you're doing multiple calculations at the same time. Exactly. As opposed to serial, which means you're doing one thing at a time. Now, you notice I put this up here in bold. I do this because this is the biggest misconception that we have. No system can magically make your programs run in parallel. We have people, probably on the average of once every couple months, get new Bayocat accounts, and there's, they try their job out, and they say, what the heck? I, this runs no faster than it did on my desktop. What's broken on your end? The problem is, it doesn't matter how many resources you throw at it. If a job is not made to run in parallel, it won't run in parallel. And the programming of that is difficult. So we have ways, we have some toolkits and things like that we're gonna talk about a little bit later, but that is the, the key to it, is that your programs have to be created to run in parallel before you can use it in more than one spot at once. And I said, notice I said no system can do this. It's not just, this is not a limitation on our part. It's a, that's the way it's written. That's the way it's gotta be. They're fast going to not open the parallelism, making things in parallel if it's not written to be that way. Some program, some problems are harder than others to run in parallel. So here we are. We have given A of N equals one, two, three, whatever up to N. Is this parallelizable very easily? The first one, four A to the N. Can you multiply four times one? Can you multiply four times two? Can you multiply four times three? Can you multiply four times four? Can you multiply four times five? Yeah, that's pretty easy. And I don't have to coordinate much to do that, right? That's, that's what we call an embarrassingly parallel problem. We can take, I can give you my data file, and I say, you pull out line one, you pull out line five, you pull out line 16. You can work, you guys can all work on part of this problem separately. What about this next one? It's a little trickier. This is supposed to be a squared. I, get, I missed, missed my superscript on there. If it's 11 a to the n squared times e to the power of a to the n plus log a to the n base, uh, log base a to the n 17. Can you work on that parallel? It's a lot more difficult calculation. You won't be able to do it in your head probably, but, but it's still what we call an embarrassingly parallel problem because, and this is, and I, the reason I bring this up in an example like this is because the calculations that we're doing on Bayocat are usually not multiplying four times a number. It's usually heavy duty mathematics. However, the principle is the same. All, for any input that we have here, we can create the output. You can, again, you can grab out your line and you can do this calculation and be happy. What about this third one? I say B to zero is equal to zero. B sub n is equal to A to the n minus B of n minus one. So B to one, you have to know what the value is of B zero before we can figure B one. You have to know the value of B one before we can figure out the value of B two. This cannot be parallelized even at all. Even such a simple calculation like that, it requires the previous result before it can go on to the next one. So again, it doesn't matter how much, how much we want to, we can't make that run in parallel because you always have to have the previous value before you go on to the next one. Typical usage we see on Bayocat, uh, you, several of you genomics guys do this, what we call pipelining. You guys run pipelining with your genomic stuff. It does this part for you, and this is, this is what we see. We love those kind of pipeline jobs because they, they're very efficient use of our resources. Um, 
typically what we'll have is they'll have jobs will come in and they'll have some part of processing that needs to be serial. They'll work on something like this where it's, where it's working on a chain of stuff. And then it says, okay, now break out and go do all this stuff in parallel. So it'll have some part that's in serial and then some part that's in parallel and run huge amounts of resources. And then it'll go back to the serial part. And they'll go back to the parallel part and then go back to the serial part and then back to the parallel part. The genomics guys really get this because they do the pipelining stuff and that's why yeah, it's, it's very well written. So but we have some uh, somebody right now who has asked for a huge amount of resources for a long period of time and it sits there and uses very little resources for a very for 99% of that time and then it's going to explode into a huge amount of, at the end. So it needs to have it needs to ask those resources because it's going to cuz because it's going to use them but the program wasn't written to do that pipelining kind of thing where it could where it can run this for a long period of time and then go from there. Yay. You're good timing on that. We're all at the same at the same spot now. Um, let's give you guys about a five minute break or so. Go get you some water, go to the bathroom break, that kind of thing. And if you have any questions, we'll be around here for a bit. Get up, stretch your legs. So so be back here in about five minutes or so. Um, I might be able to snag one from somewhere. We had more people than I thought we were going to have and we
Ran out of spots. Let's see if we can snag one from somewhere else. You want to grab, you know where more chairs are? Grab. Okay. He's going to get you one. I think we'll be fine for now. Terminal apps on iOS? Um, there's the terminal already built in to uh, oh, um, oh, iOS. Sorry, I, I was thinking OS 10. Sorry, um, I don't know. I don't have an. I don't have any Apple devices other than you know desktop. I have my, my desktop is, a, is an Apple. Um, I think Dave here does have an iPhone. I know. If anybody would know, he he would. <laughs> Because I know you bring my laptop, so I just try to find someone like mm -hmm. iPad. Yeah. I got some, but I don't think that will. Like, that, I'm not gonna use it too much. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know I have one that I run on my phone. Hey, Dave, is there a iOS terminal app that lets you SSH decently? An iOS uh, SSH client that is reasonable. Dan would know too, since he does this all the time. What is? Web. Okay. We do have a web-based terminal, also. But you, you saying that reminded me. We have this. I don't know. Ah, darn it, I don't have my password, same problem. Anyway, that will... Yeah, sure, let's go ahead and do that. Let's have to look it up here. Gate one dot baocat dot cs dot should. Well, okay. Right. But see, if it, this is this is cool though because I can come back to this on a different device. Now I gotta type it out again. <laughs> when I'm on my own computer, it's not a problem. So there we are. And this is all through a web page. So, sure. We're actually, that, that's on our list of things, cool tools to show you guys. Yeah, toward the end. 
All right. Next section here we have is on some parallel programming. And there are two languages that are used a lot for parallel programming. There's Fortran and there's C. Just me speaking personally, I can't stand Fortran. So all the examples today are gonna to be in C. <laughs> so that's just my personal prejudice. Doesn't if you like it, I'm not going to dislike you or anything. Just that that's what I like. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot to mention this. This I, I didn't realize I had this slide in here. Um, if you want to go through some more about, uh, matter of fact, a lot of this stuff that we're covering here today, as far as general stuff and not Bayos Cat specific stuff, this page right here, the supercomputing in plain plain English. There's the URL for it. Or if you just look up supercomputing in plain English, it'll take you to that site. That is uh, a guy down at OU has put this together and it's a class that he does like an hour a week kind of thing, and, but he's recorded it. So I think you have to go back to the 2011 version, if I remember right, to get the full, uh, the, the full version, they, the, the, what am I trying to say? The full videos. Um, because of ADA requirements, they weren't able to put later ones on there. And they can't get them transcribed because it costs money and they don't have a budget for it. So therefore, they're back to the old version, which is 2011. But still, this is some really good information on supercomputing and how all this is put together. And a matter of fact, I draw several of my examples from his. Um, so that's a, a, good, uh, a, good, a good resource. That I didn't change. That'll get you there. But support.baocat.cas.ksu.edu is actually our support pages. I'll change that before I send this out. <laughs> and emailing us, the three of us, if you send to this email address, that gets put into our ticketing system. Uh, I know that there are several people in this room just based on the names that I saw registered that do this on a regular basis, and that's great. So. If you send email to this address, it goes into our ticketing system, and you might get a response to whoever, which one of us can either best answer the question or whoever gets to it first if, if more than one of us can answer the question. So that's how you get a hold of us. Parallel programming. Now, I have a copy of these all in my home directory, and these are all open to the world. And I put this on here because when I send you out, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on sending these slides out to you guys afterwards so that you guys can have them. But here's where all these examples are coming from, so you can kind of look at them yourself if you want to edit them or whatever. So, they shamelessly stolen and adapted from this other website. Um, we're gonna do some background includes, and how many of you are familiar with programming in C, first of all? Wow. <laughs> this is going to be, how about Fortran? Does anybody do Fortran? A little bit? <laughs> One. So you, what's your programming experience in then? Just shout it out. What's your programming experience in? Or are you doing any programming? Java? In what? Python. Got it. Any other? R? <laughs> Okay, R is not multi-threaded. Um, that's why we call them high throughput jobs because generally they have a whole bunch to go through fast, but they are not getting them to run in parallel or is a royal pain in the rear. Trust me, I've tried. Perhaps if you wanted to build models around <laughs> okay, so we're going to kind of go through some of the some of these programming examples here. Um, if you yes. That, 
that is that that is parallel. Um, this next section is about programming in it, though. So how to write the programs. So that's why I was kind of surprised that so many people signed up for this portion of the class because most people are not interested in writing parallel code. And if you have code that you want to have parallelized, send an email to that email address you have earlier, and Dave will be love to have lots of work to do because that's what he does. <laughs> And Java will do parallel. However, Java is kind of inefficient. You don't see a lot of uh, Java programs written to take advantage of it because it's not very it's not very efficient code. And when you get to high performance computing, being high performance, you want it to be as efficient code as possible. Mainly because most places aren't like Bayocat. Most places are we want you running 100% CPU all the time, and we want it to be doing useful work. And you're going to have a very limited window. If you go to, like I said, to exceed some of the national resources, they're going to have a very limited window to get your calculations done. And if you have a limited window, you're going to need that code to be as efficient as possible, and that means not Java. That means C or Fortran. <laughs> yes? It, the more low level it is, the more efficient you can make it. Does that make sense? <laughs> You can write some really bad code in low-level languages. I trust me, I've I've done it. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you probably see some of that here. <laughs> so, um, what a fork does th th again. This is th so. This is these examples are going to be in C. Uh, most everything you see as far as uh, parallel programming is going to be in either C or Fortran. And uh, if you go Matter of fact, if you sit through Henry's course of supercomputing and playing English, he has, he has uh, examples there, and he brings up examples in both. But you won't see Java, and you won't see Python, and you won't see R, and those kinds of things. So my apologies for that. Uh, Adam's really the Python guy in the room, too, and he just left. So I, don't, I, I know that it will do some level of uh, parallelization, too, if you jump through some hoops, but I don't know to what level that is, either. Again, it's not very efficient, because Python is not a compiled language. It's, a, it's an interpreted language. So that, that'll slow it down some, or just by itself. So here, I'm going to kind of go step through this code here. And like I say, if you decide that you don't want to have anything to do with C, you're going to go hang out in the lobby for a bit. You're not going to offend me, but I'm going to go through it anyway. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up a, a global variable. And then I'm going to run this, this loop here. I create a type called child PID, which is a, 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 a process ID. I'm going to declare a local variable of zero. And then I'm going to fork it. A fork makes a copy of all the memory and variables and everything like that. So you basically have two identical environments. Then I check from my child process ID. If it's zero, then we know it's the, we're looking at the child process. So you're, both sides run the same code. And you're going to notice down here, that means we're at the parent process. Yes, you have a question already? How, how, these are on, in my, on Bayocat. These, these are all here. And I'm going to actually compile all these for you and show you. I wonder if I can. Oh. I can't hear, but tell you what I can do here. 
I can. That's a little better, Nick. Can you see that a little better? Or do I need to make it even bigger? So this is starting right kind of where the last one left off. Yeah, that's good. All right. So when you fork something, you have to have a way of knowing whether your the, the same code runs both. The, so we made a full copy, and we have two full copies of the program running now. So it has to know whether it's running the child or the parent. Typically, when we do this, we're not doing this just once. We're doing this several times. And by doing this several times, you might have several different, one, one parent and then several different children underneath it. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to check to see if we are running on the child process. If we are running the child process, then we're going to increase that local variable. We're going to increase the global variable and put those out. If it's the parent process, we're going to set the local variable to 10 and we're going to add two to the global. So let's see what happens when we compile this and run it. CC. When it stops. Pardon? When it stops. Mm -hmm. When it stops working. Oh, but I've never. I don't put a loop in here. I haven't put a loop in there yet. That's the. That's a good point because most time when you're doing a fork, you're going to do a loop and do this several times, and you need to have a process, uh, something in there to watch how many children you have, so that you don't keep on forking and keep on forking. This one just forks one time. The program is done and is finished. So that's why this one isn't going. This is not going to cause any problems at all. Okay, so in this case, my parent process finished first. And you notice that it include, that in the parent process, it set my variable, my local variable to 10, like we told it to, and it increased the global variable by two. The child process, it, include, it set the var local variable to one and the global variable by one. You notice that it didn't add. One and two is not three. So the really is no, the global variables are really difficult to do in by forking. That's the trickiest part about using fork as a, a parallel processing mechanism. It creates an old new process. This is the old way to do it. This is the only way that I was even aware of when I was in school of, of, of going about parallel programming. And it becomes really tricky because you have to set up functions that basically call memory locations and things like that. So you're, if you wanted to actually add global variables together, it becomes very, very tricky. So you kind of have to have some sort of master process that coordinates that and has to do a really good job of it and collecting all that, all that data. Let me look at... So... This is what, two, for example, two. Okay, same kind of thing. This is. So this is how we get around that. And that is in C, we're gonna create a pointer to our global variable, GLB2. And then, we're going to set that pointer to zero. And that's, that's basically the only thing I've done here is instead of increasing the, the uh, variable, I've, I'm using pointers. And again, these will be on slides that I send out, so hopefully it won't be quite so uh, obtuse here. Before I do this, let me. Ah. Okay, so here I took my global variable plus one in the child process, 
plus two in the parent process. And you notice that I end up with the same problem. It seems like it should work, but it doesn't. This is the way you actually do it. You have this big ugly thing here <laughs> called a memory map. And again, these will be on the slides because I won't, I'm not expecting to teach you guys C in one day, especially if you guys were all C experts, we might go through this a little more in depth as it is. This is going to be kind of general concept. So we're going to, we'll probably have plenty of time left at the end of this one because this will kind of go fast for this part. So, you know, you have to make a big ugly memory map way of making all this happen. And when we compile this one, then now you see finally that we got finally the, our global value actually in, did ended up with three on one of our things because we added one and then we added two. It's 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 a difficult stuff, especially pork programming is is tricky stuff and it's not fun if you've ever had to do much of it. However. The good news is there are better ways. Yes. What's that? Something recursive, a problem calling itself. A self-referencing program? Yes. Recursive programming? They're talking about? Yes. Yes. Um, again, but you have the same caveats. So you might have some master process that they're collecting. As you're, as you're forking off children processes, and you have to have a way of keeping track of which one's which and which one's getting data back. So it is, it is certainly possible, it's still not easy. So anyway, we just created two processes. Again, you just fork again, make three, four, do it in a loop, you can make 15, you can make as many as you want. So now, OpenMP, it gets a whole lot easier when you start using Things like OpenMP. Um, <laughs> you can see the uh, website that I get this from. Now, the only th tricky thing is you also have to tell it. Oh, you have to tell it that you're using OpenMP when you're doing this. So here we have three files that I have back in my directory again, and we're gonna. Set these out here. Okay. All right, so this has a program that we're taking, it's in on the command. We create integers called n threads and, and TID. And then we have this special command here, the one listed in purple, that says do this parallelized, basically. We tell it to get the thread number, and it says hello world from thread number whatever. And only the master thread does, computes the whole number of threads. So you can see that even there's actually a lot more comments in here than, than before, but if you actually look at the number of command lines, it's much smaller, it's a whole lot easier to deal with, and it makes your programs multi-threaded very easily in comparison. I created eight threads here. Now, I want you to notice something here, though. When I run this program twice, what do you notice about the output? It's not the same order. It's non-deterministic. It's whichever one happens to get there first, gets there first. So, the number of threads, 
the parent process, it's it's always coming up with the same answer. But it sell but each one of these threads, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, they're all out there. <coughs> all these threads are are working. But then they all get they all eventually get there, but their order is just whatever happens to get there first, whatever the processor happens to get to first. That's the only caveat with these. Um, do I have anything else here? Sure. I think it would be worth trying to look at here. If you guys are not into C programming and all that, this is going to be very boring. I think I'm just going to skip it. The next example here was just showing how I can do scheduling. I can uh, within itself. And I could say now as soon as the first one's done, now we're doing the second one, then we're the second one's done, then we do the third one, that kind of thing. Boring details being a good point. I think we'll we're done with this part. So GCC, the new the GNU C compiler, that's pretty much standard in Linux for C compilers. Yes. <laughs> Good question. Uh, Intel tended to make a slightly more uh, slightly more efficient code for Intel processors. Um, GCC is probably more widely used because the Intel compiler is licensed; it's not free, and GCC is free. And every, pretty much every system you'll ever be on will have GCC available. So we see probably probably ninety percent of people are using GCC as opposed to Intel. Now, one thing about OpenMP, if you if you ever do get to use OpenMP, I implore you to watch, look at this last line. The set number of threads. By default, it will use every thread available. You should ignore that now. We didn't for a long time. So you have somebody running, they'd ask for, you know, four processes on a mage, and pretty soon they're using the entire thing because they're because you have you need to set the correct number of threads. 
Okay, MPI. This is where it starts getting fun. And there are several different versions of MPI. Um, include, there's an R version of MPI. Uh, Python will use MPI, correct, Adam? If you ask it to, yeah. So this is from Wikipedia. Message passing interface or MPI. Now notice that the last one was MP, OpenMP. We use OpenMPI here. They're not the same. They kind of have similar properties, but they're very distinct. One, one is just OpenMP though, is just for using on a single machine. OpenMPI is for using on multiple machines or a single machine, either one. So message passing interface is a standardized portable message passing system designed by a group of researchers from academia and industry to function on a wide variety of parallel computers. Standard defines the syntax and semantics of a core of library routines useful to a wide range of users writing portable message passing programs in Fortran 77 or the C programming language. Again, that's been expanded since then. That's what it was written for though. Several well-tested and efficient implementations of MPI include some that are free and in the public domain. These foster the development of a parallel software industry and their encouraged development of portable and scalable large-scale parallel applications. So MPI is really what let supercomputers be supercomputers. That's the short version. Now, I'm going to use a contrived example. This is from the supercomputing in plain English. If you, if you go through the supercomputing in plain, plain English class, you will, this will look very familiar to you. So this is how he explains it. Imagine you're on an island in a little hut. On the hut's a desk, and on the desk is a phone, a pencil, a calculator, a piece of paper with instructions, and a piece of paper with numbers. Here's your instructions, and here's your data. So it says, what to do? Add the number in slot 27 and the number in slot 239, put the result in slot 71. Slot 71 is equal to the number in slot 118, then call this other number and leave a voicemail containing the number in slot 9, 962. Got it? So all you've got is your phone, pencil, calculator, Instructions and data. More things. Call this, uh, otherwise, call your voicemail box and collect a voicemail from this number and put that number in another slot. So these are kind of limited instructions. You can only do these certain things. But you're really kind of isolated from the rest of the world. So we've got two kinds of instructions here. We have arithmetic, logical, but the addition, the comparison, that kind of thing. We have communication. We have, you know, call this number and leave a voicemail or call your voicemail box and collect a voicemail. Kind of the same, that's kind of the analogous situation here. If you're on a hut in the island, you aren't specifically aware of anyone else. The way M MPI applications are. They are there, they're, they're running. They don't know if anybody else is running or not by themselves. You don't know whether anyone else is working on the same problem as you are and you don't know who's at the other end of the phone line. All you know is what to do with the voicemails you get and what numbers to send the voicemail to. Now, suppose that Horst, I don't know where he comes up with these names. Like I said, I just copied it. Horst is on another island. I think he's not trying to offend anybody by picking a name that nobody had in this class. Now, suppose that Horst is on another island somewhere in the same kind of hut with the same kind of equipment, and suppose he has the same list of instructions as you, but a different set of numbers, both date and phone numbers. Like you, he doesn't know if there's anyone else working on his problem. And we also have Bruce and Dee in Huts on Islands. Each of the four has the exact same list of instructions, but different lists of numbers. Now, if the numbers that you call are each other's, that is, your instructions have you call Horse, Bruce, and Dee. Horse has him call Bruce, Dee's, and you, and so on. Then you might be working together on the same problem. Does that make sense? Each person is very localized to what they have. They have their own instructions. <coughs> they have their own communications, but they're not aware of what the other places are doing. But they still might be working on the same problem, even though it's unbeknownst to them. All this data is private. I can't see anybody else's. They can't see mine. So my numbers are private. There's no way for anyone to share what their data is here except by leaving them in voicemails. So why do we use voicemail as an example here? It's because of the cost of communication. Long distance calls have two costs. You have a connection charge, which is the fixed cost of connecting to someone else's, even if you're only connected for a second. And there's a per minute charge. The connection charge is large, and you want to make as few calls as possible. Now, as an example here, hope this is loud enough, I think we'll be all right.
Start Great ads. An, extra <laughs> an ad for an ad. Okay, people, this is a phone. This is a dollar. You still with me? That's good. Now, dial this number, and all your long distance calls from home could cost less than a buck. That's right, with 10, 10, 220. All calls up to 20 minutes are only 99 cents. Talk longer, and it's just 10 cents for each extra minute. No fees, no contracts. Am I right, Fucci? Just about 10, 10, 220, then one, then the number. Bottom line, you get up to 20 minutes on this or less than this. You got that? Good. So I'm not mistaken. I think nature's calling my dog. Okay, why, how can 10, 10, 220 do this? How can they charge basically five cents a minute for all their calls up to 20 minutes? It's, it's not directly related to MPI, but it's very similar. So the, 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 we're working on analogies here. Well, how can they do that? How can they have 20 minute charge for 20 minute call for a dollar? That's probably less than their cost to, for the lines. No guesses? What's the average length of a phone call in the United States today? Take a guess. You're close. Average is two. So you're paying a dollar for two minutes. That's a pretty good rate they're getting on that, right? The point is that the connection charge is really expensive. The per minute charge is pretty low. They did some analysis on MPI and found that it's essentially the same as having a $150 uh, connection charge with a one cent per minute after that. So you want to, you, the, the point being, when you're dealing with MPI, you want to keep as few connections as possible. Now, obviously the beauty of it is that you can make those connections, but that's the, that's the overhead cost with this. We want to keep those uh, connections as few as possible and as much information as we can while we're on the same line. So MPI, talking between machines, now you can have two MPI hosts running on the same machine, but they don't know they're running on the same machine. All they know is that we have, I'm talking to somebody else. They're, they're on this hut, on an island. They don't know who they're talking to. So advantage is MPI. You have interaction among different programming languages. If you are really sadistic enough, you can go between R and Fortran. That'd be... Nobody even thought that was funny. Geez, I'm going home. <laughs> Interaction among different machines. This is really handy in something like Beocat, where we have 150 different machines. You can be running your jobs on multiple ones. Data collection. Scaling. Uh, even if you go on to some of the biggest resources in the world, they'll all have MPI available, and you can talk you know, to huge numbers of machines all at once. Does have disadvantages. Cost of getting started. Not only in terms of communication, but in terms of writing it. It's not efficient for small amounts of data. If you've only got a small bit of problem, typically like we see with R code, it's, you, you, it's all stuff that'll fit on one process anyway. Why do you want to even separate it out onto multiples? Coding is complex. And again, don't confuse it with OpenMPI. OpenMP, did I say the MPI? Don't confuse OpenMPI and OpenMP. <laughs> and like I said, just because they sound a lot alike, I even sometimes will stumble over it as I just did. I know what's right in my head. <laughs> Coming out of the mouth is a different issue. So this tells you how to get that in, uh, started here. There's an MPI example here. Can I have it? Ah, I called it MPI. So here we have some MPI code. And it's basically meant just to be a, an, an example. So we have a declare number of processes rank, length of name, an ID. I have a pro character string of the processor name. I initialize, I talk about my communication size and rank and all this kind of stuff. And then I say process whatever on whatever out of whatever. So I have several different things going on here at once. 
this is the code that I use. Again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this to do my OpenMP. And then I call finalize, so I'm done. So I'm going to do <laughs> MPICC dash F open MPI. Did I do that wrong? Dash F open MP. So you notice I'm all running this on the same host. So Athena is the machine I'm logged into. So it's telling you on Athena, I'm running a thread zero. Again, like on the OpenMP example, non-deterministic. This one had zero, three, one, four, three, seven, one. So they're, they're going in different orders, starting up several different processes. Each one's doing its own thing and reporting back. MPI is, uh, if you're going to get programs that scale out, MPI is the way to go. It's more difficult to write for to begin with, but it is the way to go if you're, go if, if you're getting to large scale problems. And again, Dave knows a whole lot more about this than I do. <laughs> so one last thing. Like I said, writing this is hard. So my best advice is that if somebody else has already solved the problem for you, let them. <laughs> we have all programs installed on, on Beocat already, and you can install your own. Um, NOMD, Blast, OpenFoam, those are some examples from different, from, from different areas of, of software that is already written to take advantage of the most efficient way of doing things, whether it's OpenMP or OpenMPI. If they've already written the code, all you have to do is shove your own data in there. Don't, you know, use, use the toolkits that are out there. I'm very, very little, you know, there's, there's little new under the sun. If you have to write your own code, do it. But if you don't, use the work of others. It'll be a whole lot better for you and for them both. And like I said, you can also install stuff in your home directory. I, at this point, I'm going to go out to our website and show you how to install something in your own directory because I had to do this for somebody and said, you know, we should document this. Where is our videos? There we are. Okay. So the resolution on this is not fantastic. You can go and do this on your own. It's from your home directory. So here's an example from a program I was asking about. It's called OpenBugs. First thing I need to do is find the Linux download here. And you'll see that I found it right here. I'm going to copy that. Flip over here and I'm going to log into Beocat. Notice that I don't use a password because I have keys set up, but you may be asked for a password at this point. Okay, we're down here, we're ready to download the program. To do that, we're going to use a program called wget, W -E -G -E -T. I'm going to paste that link. And we run into a problem we sometimes run into with links. You notice that there is a ampersand in the line. It doesn't like that. Uh, Linux sees that as a different uh, command. So we're going to have to tell it, put that in quotation marks. So get. And we're going to come back over here. When I highlighted that, it copied it to my clipboard. So I'm going to copy this again. Put quotes around it. And now I'm downloading the program. Uh, you notice that it saved it as a really strange named file with a whole bunch of extras, so I'm going to move that first. I'm going to rename it. 
I'm going to rename it just what it's meant to be, which is this last little part here. If you're downloading this straight from a web browser, it would do that for you. Wget is not that smart. <laughs> so now we have a, pro uh, yeah, a program downloaded called openbugs-3.2.2.tar.gz. So we're going to unzip that file. So to do that, we're going to use tar, extract, zipped, uh, verbose, we want to see the files that are going on the screen, and the file name is openbugs 3.2.2.tar.gz. And this is going to take a little while because it's a rather large zip file. Close to the end. Okay. So now I need to go into the open bugs folder. And I noticed up here there is there's usually some files in there that give us some hints as to what needs to go on. We have a README, which is usually like a lot of license information, that kind of thing, but we have an install. So let's look at the install file. And it tells you, as most programs will, that there are make scripts run by configure, make, and make install. I'm going to look through here to see if there's anything else really strange that this program does. I'm not seeing anything. However, there is something I'm looking for. Installation names, that's not it. We're not doing anything funky as far as compilers. But here we go. Notice that it asks for as prefix equals directory for a installation prefix. Otherwise, it's going to try to install it system wide. And of course, since you don't have root privileges, it's not going to allow you to do that. Matter of fact, unless I specifically tell it to, I don't have root privileges. So I'm going to have to install this in my home directory by using this format. And we're at the end of the file. So we're going to run what they said dot slash configure. Prefix equals, and here I'm going to put in my home directory, which is homes, Kyle Hudson. I don't want to install it in the root of my home, I want to give it a directory, so I'm going to call it openbugs. And what this does is it automatically configures your system for our environment. They make these rather generic, and that way if you're installing on a different Unix system, on a Linux system, whatever, it can kind of figure out what options it needs to put into the make files so it'll create the program correctly. Got done doing that, so we're going to run make. And it starts compiling the program. This program actually itself is pretty small. The biggest part of what it was expanding was documentation. So it's already done there, and now it's compiled everything. Now, this is the important part when I put that prefix in there. Now, when I do a make install, you notice that it's copying it to Holmes, Kyle Hudson, OpenBugs, rather than trying to put it in the system directories where I don't have permission right now to do that. And there we go. So I'm going to change to my bugs directory without the extension on there. Take a look, and you'll see I now have three folders in there called bin, live, and share. The one that where open bug sits is called bin. And if I look inside there. You see, I have an executable file called openbugs. And if I run dot slash openbugs, you'll notice that it's actually waiting for you to tell it what to do. So here I'm going to actually quit, just like they tell me. And if I wanted to submit the, a job, let's say I had a program out there, let's do QSub, homes. My name, Openbugs, Ben, Openbugs, 
and then I could say path to my data file. And that would then submit that into the queue. Of course, you can put in your queue subscript all the standard things of how long you want it to take, where you want it to run, that type of thing. But that's how you run a program from your home directory in on Bedcat. Thanks. So we put that in here after our last intro to BioCat class. We talked about doing your own. That was somebody something somebody asked about was open bugs, and it was a fairly easy example. But there's a lot of software we, that we don't have. I mean, we don't know every area on campus, that kind of thing, and maintaining it is a pain in the rear. So what we do is we have you guys go ahead and install this at your own home directories. And that was an example of how to do that. So that, that example is on the website. Please feel free to, to review that sometime on your own if you need to install your own stuff in your home directory, which is a very common thing to do. And what we ask is if you have special software like this, you try to install it yourself. If you do run into problems, then you can get in touch with us. We're more than happy to help. But we'd invite you to at least try to install it for yourself uh, first, uh, rather than just uh, bugging us and saying install it. But we, we get we get lots of requests for could you install this software? And our answer is no, but you can do it yourself. Here's how. And we point you to the video and we point you to the, you know, documentation, that kind of thing. Matter and like I said, we've even had people that have had some some problems and I spent a couple days last month uh, helping somebody out who couldn't get their software installed. It was kind of a tricky thing and we figured it out and I and I helped them out. We have no problem doing that, but you know, we do need you to be able to do to pretty much install your own software, that kind of thing, and keep up on the updates, that kind of thing itself. Giving up with this many updates, you might need version one, you might need version two, you might need version 1.5, and we can't keep up with that system-wide. That's why we have it do, that's the main reason why we have it do, you do that in your own home directories. Any questions?